everyone! This week we are going to take a brief look at some tips and tricks to get you to be an expert note taker in class. Now, I know you might have some sort of different ways that you might like to take notes in class, um, and it all depends on whether you have a predominantly sort of technology-based way of doing things, or whether you're kind of a classic pen and paper person, or whether you're going to be um, sort of an online student versus an in-person student. But hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to try out some things and see what works best for you so that you can take really good notes that can help you later on when it comes to exam time. So here's how we sort of prepare for the idea of note taking, right? Because for everything that we do in this college readiness course, we have to prepare, organize, work, evaluate, and rethink. Remember that. So how do we prepare to take notes? Well, what you do is first off you have to identify the goals for the course. And all of these things are usually laid out in a syllabus. You should be able to know um, from reading the syllabus what are the important things that are going to be focused on in the course? And you can get that usually from the uh, course objectives or student objectives portion of a syllabus that usually most syllabi should probably have. So identify the goals for the course because those might point to a lot of important things that when a professor says them, you should probably take notes on them. Another way to prepare is that if you have certain assignments or if you know ahead of time what the lecture is going to be about, um, make sure that you do your homework, if there is any, before you come to class. Of course, if it's something like this course um, or some other courses where you need to know what the lecture is in order to perform the assignments, then completely disregard what I just said. But if you know that your class is going to be focusing on I don't know, uh, taking notes, right, that week, then maybe it might be useful to have read the chapter in the book if you have it, or um, maybe in this case, for this specific class, to have gone through the PowerPoint before listening to me lecture about it. That way you sort of have a base idea of what is going to be talked about so that you can further refine your notes and be prepared to ask questions in case something pops up that you might not understand. Another thing is that, as we learned before when we were talking about learning styles and sort of multiple intelligences, that applies to you, but that also applies to your professor. And some professors you have are going to be fabulous, you are going to link up perfectly, they will teach you in the exact learning style that you have and they'll make things interesting. Some instructors may not be as accommodating, so what you have to do is you can't really fight it. Unless it's sort of the first week of class where you have some wiggle room when it comes to dropping and adding and switching your schedule around, once you're in the class you're kind of in it for the approximately 15 week long haul for a fall or spring semester. So you're stuck with the instructor, so you have to accept them despite what their limitations might be. Whether they are the kind of person that will read a PowerPoint word for word rather than sort of describe and sort of talk around bullet points and you're not necessarily getting any extra information from it, or maybe they're the kind of person that will blaze through something super quick and have a bajillion slides and doesn't even give you time to sort of write information down before barreling through, or maybe they're not really tech savvy and maybe they don't use the PowerPoint type stuff in the first place and you're just sort of running on their words, right? Whatever their limitations might be, you have to accept them. You're in and for the long haul, but you should be able to work around it. And when you prepare, perform a pre-class warm-up, which basically means if you have a textbook, depending on whether or not um, you usually have to bring it to class, before class, go to the chapter that you know you're going to be covering that day. 
or if you have some articles that you know the person is going to go over, maybe have them out and sort of glance over them really quick to sort of refresh your memory on, on what the topic is going to be and make sure that your papers are in order. Review your notes from last class to see if there are any points that you might need to bring up at the beginning of class in order to sort of get some answers. So make sure that you are nice and prepped and you're not kind of going into this uh, completely unaware of what's going on. Oh, and this is a really, really cool one. Choose a good seat. So there is a recommendation that whenever you are choosing your seat in class, now of course in college you don't necessarily have seating assignments, which is awesome because you just sit wherever you want, and sometimes you're going to have classes that will be 20 students, sometimes you're going to have classes that might be 200 students in a giant auditorium. So, depending on where you are, choosing where you sit can actually be a really, really important factor. If you know that you are going to get distracted really, really easily, take that opportunity and get yourself a seat somewhere in the front. Um, if you can sort of work well, um, if you know that the professor is more of a lecturer than a sort of visual learner, also work your way up to the front because you never know if they have a microphone, usually they don't, um, maybe they're not necessarily used to professors, you know, professors sometimes aren't used to having giant auditorium classes and might not necessarily project as much as you would like them to. Um, so what is usually recommended when you select a seat for a class is that you select a seat in what is called the T. So picture a giant T and what that T is, just picture a large capital T, and that basically represents where the most recommended spots are for you to sit. All the way in the front and all the way in the center. So whenever you see your classroom, identify where the T is and sit there. That way you have every opportunity to see the PowerPoints, see whatever they write on the board, and be able to hear the professor and be able to make eye contact with them in case you do actually have a question. So, now that we've prepared, let's organize our tools here. And first, choose the appropriate writing utensil. This sounds like the most common sense thing in the world, but people have gotten nailed for it before. If you're in a math class, or you know that you might need to sort of shuffle your words around, shuffle numbers, erase, maybe do some work in class, Perhaps a permanent writing utensil is not the best thing in the world. On the other hand, maybe you are left-handed, and one thing that, that sort of plagues a lot of left-handed people is that um, as they write across the page with a pencil, it has a tendency to smudge. Make sure that you use the right writing utensil. Um, even when selecting a pen, sometimes there are pens that might look really awesome and write really well, but they bleed through the page so that you're only really able to use one side of the page at a time. Make sure you pick a really, really cool pen. Or use pencil whenever it's recommended. Just use the right tool for the job. Also choose a good notebook. And this is, of course, you know, assuming that you still kind of kick it with a pen and paper writing vibe. And a good notebook might be one where if you need to sort of shuffle things around, then maybe you have some loose leaf paper and a three ring binder. Maybe you're the kind of person that wants to get just like a five subject notebook for the five classes that you're taking and just keep everything in one place. Make sure that you pick something that is right for you and is gonna be appropriate for your needs. Also, figure out whether or not you need to bring the textbook because A, it's going to save you a lot of headaches and B, it can also give you an opportunity to sort of not only take notes, but if there is something in the textbook that you can directly refer to while you're taking notes to help sort of supplement your note taking or something that you want to bring up in class as a potential question, then you can go ahead and, and sort of take care of that by bringing the textbook. But otherwise, for the most part, you may not necessarily have to bring a textbook, but 
make sure that you know ahead of time whether or not your professor is going to refer directly to it because you don't want to be caught without it. So how about a laptop? You have to ask the professor. Um, some professors have actually kind of some strict rules about using electronic devices in their classroom. Some people are kind of anti-laptop, anti-tablet because they want people to be focused on the lecture and not be tempted by having Facebook open in another tab, which I totally understand as a professor. However, I also understand that keeping typed notes is sometimes a really, really convenient thing to do, and especially if you can just have all of your notes and all of your work all in one place on, on your laptop, I totally understand, and, and, I, and I usually use my, my laptop or iPad for note-taking, but some professors might not necessarily enjoy that idea, so always ask ahead of time, and sometimes they'll have the policies in the syllabus. Also, if you know that you're the kind of person that might be distracted by bringing a laptop, do yourself the favor and don't bring it. And especially if you might be the kind of person who has more of a either a tactile kinesthetic learning style, um, where you sort of like need to sort of feel things out in order to learn them better, or if you have a read-write style, it might be useful for you to take your notes on pen and paper first and then retype them on your laptop later, which might actually help you internalize the material a lot better. So there you go. Some teachers have a strict note technology policy, so ask. And also there's another thing, um, which I'm not entirely sure if that comes up in this slide, but um, if you are a, an auditory learner, and we sort of brought this up in our learning style thing, they might have some strict rules about whether or not you take notes with um, electronic devices, but they might also have something against you tape recording their lectures, so always ask ahead of time, but some professors that might actually be a really, really useful thing to do is for you to tape record their lectures um, and then listen back to them later, especially if you're one of those people that has an auditory learning style. So speaking of that, in the process of taking notes, you have to encounter the difference between hearing versus thinking. Hearing is just the involuntary act of sensing sounds. Basically, you are listening to what I'm, well, rather, you're hearing what I'm saying now, and I could be saying anything like water, melon, banana, fish boat, and you would not have even noticed that because you're just hearing things, but you're not actually listening. So use active listening when you are in class. And what do you do when you're actively listening? You focus on what's being said, you make sense of it, you think about it, and you can recall it accurately. In my own classes, I definitely see a lot of students that like to indulge in the whole hearing thing and they like to sit there and they think that they can absorb the information just by sitting there and that's not necessarily the case. So I would like to see more students engage in the sort of active listening portion. And listen for key ideas here. So if you see something on a PowerPoint and it's a bullet point like listen for key ideas and the professor says it exactly like that. Now remember, listen for key ideas. Or maybe they say things like, there are two kinds of ways to engage with your material when you are working. You can hear or you can think. The fact that someone said there are two kinds of fill in the blank, this and this, usually they're trying to trigger you to understand that that is a key idea. Listen for things like when they list things, when they pause, when they spend a particular amount of time on one topic, and also when you see sort of things, hopefully if, if the professor is sort of hip to the, to the ways of PowerPoint and everything, their PowerPoints can also be the key to knowing what are some key ideas to write down. So listen for key ideas. Listen to whether or not they are being repeated. This is what it means to listen for key ideas. See what I mean? 
So when you're taking down notes, I know that it can be really, really daunting, especially if you have a professor that is really experienced and really knows their stuff and is likes to sort of engage in things like anecdotes and ramble on and on, as I often do. And it could be daunting and you kind of feel the need to write everything down. Don't feel that kind of pressure. But do know that you shouldn't be writing down literally every single thing. Try to use short and abbreviated phrases, like... Like this one. Use short, abbreviated phrases. If I wanted to abbreviate that even more, I would just say short abbreviated phrases or short abbrev period phrases, right? Try to write things down in a way that'll make you take things down quickly, but also you'll be able to understand them later. Use abbreviations whenever you can, especially if those are abbreviations that will come up often throughout the course of the class. Maybe you can develop a little bit of a code for things that often pop up during class. Use an outline form, which is actually pretty useful. Copy info on the PowerPoint, of course, hint, hint. So if things are bolded and, and they look like they are definitions, you should probably write those down. If it's important enough for the professor to take enough time to put it up there for you, then it's probably important enough for you to remember. 99.9% .9 of the time, if they took the effort of putting it on a slide, then it should be something that you should get to know. So, whenever possible, co copy the info on the PowerPoint. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, nudge. So, if for whatever reason, you know, a, a lot of these things apply to a class that's mostly lecture-based, but if there are a lot of class discussions going on, then maybe you might need to use different techniques, so always be aware of that. If there are any points raised at the end of class, that's usually the time where the professor likes to sort of wrap things up and summarize, and that might be a really, really good way of being able to distill everything that sort of just went on. So pay attention to those points raised at the end of the class, because they usually like to leave you with something so that you can walk away remembering one specific thing, so pay attention to that specific thing. There are so many people and I wish that, I, I wish there was sort of more effective ways of, of, of being able to sort of curb this habit, but if you have, say, a, a, a 7.50 to 9.05 class, at 9 o'clock is when everybody sort of starts the shuffle of putting away their books, putting things away, turning their phones back on, all that stuff, and it's just sort of din of conversation that happens with five minutes left. I wish that people just got out of that habit entirely. Don't be that person, because at the very end of class is when the professor might want to raise some really important points. So don't do that. It's annoying. And also, ask questions. Please don't be scared to ask questions. Often, more often than not, you will not be the only person that has that specific concern or question, so you're not just helping yourself, you're probably helping out most of the class when you ask a question. And th the point of an instructor is to instruct, is to teach you, and if they're not getting their point across, or there's something that you want to have a little bit more clarity on, then, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to sort of take questions, unless, of course, you know, they want to hold questions until the end of class, or maybe they prefer to do things privately via email. But don't be afraid to ask your instructor questions, because despite, you know, the way that you think that your professor is sort of built and maybe your professor's kind of scary or maybe they're, you know, kind of, you know, old and grisly and tenured and they don't really care anymore, they do care. And they, they all, all we want as instructors is we want you to succeed. So if there are ways that we can help you do that, then we would love to know. And, and maybe it's a question that a lot of people have, and then by addressing it, maybe we can sort of change up our thing to make sure that that is, is clear all across the board in future sessions, right? So you're helping out by asking questions, so don't be scared. Now, 
Now, now, now, when should you be scared? Sometimes there are problem instructors. Not every instructor is going to be super cool. And not every instructor is going to have your perfect learning style. They're, they're, they're not going to be making references to Pokemon all the time. Sometimes the professor might be kind of boring or kind of dull, or maybe the subject matter is something that you're required to take, but you're not necessarily interested in. And the professor maybe doesn't interest you in taking that uninteresting subject. Either way, you might run into a problem instructor or two during your college career, but there are ways to deal with them. First off, it's a temporary situation. Unless this person teaches, you know, all of the classes in your major, you might not ever run into that professor again, so just stick it out for however many weeks the semester is. It's a temporary situation. Always ask questions. Always ask questions, because there may be things like misunderstandings. The professor might be working from a PowerPoint that is so old that maybe they haven't updated it and they're thinking that they're being clear when really they're not and asking questions might be might be ways to have them sort of adjust their stuff and having them explain something you know might be a really really good way for you to get clarity on something it's way better to ask a question than to just sort of sit there and and hope that you eventually get it ask questions really ask questions if, for whatever reason, their, their technique is, isn't working and maybe you're not the only sort of person that feels that way, um, you can sort of schedule a private session to talk with them and, and see if there are ways that they can kind of alter their technique. Um, and usually do this privately and please do it politely because... Especially now when sort of older professors are kind of moving into this sort of world of technology and everything, you know, they, they, they sort of might be stuck in older ways. I do remember one professor that I had that was used to teaching classes that were, you know, 20 kids um, in a classroom at a time, and then they were confronted with a 200-room auditorium, and they weren't sure what to do. And, and their previous style of just being able to lecture and engage in class discussions didn't really work anymore now that you're dealing with 200 students instead of 20, right? But people were able to sort of alter, to, to sort of speak with her and say that, you know, this lecture wasn't necessarily working for them, so, you know, she eventually sort of took the effort to try and create more PowerPoints and more sort of visual aids for their students so that you know, all 200 could benefit from the information. So, it's possible, but be, do it privately and, and, and be polite about it, definitely. Because, because we're sensitive as instructors and we don't want to get our feelings hurt. It's not, it's not fun. Now, there is safety in numbers, of course. Um, hook up with your fellow students and, and see if anybody else is having the same issues that you have. And, you know, maybe you can schedule a meeting with a bunch of you or, or maybe have a bunch of different students schedule meetings with that person. That way they can get a, a really good idea. Um, the instructor could get a good idea that, well, okay, well, maybe this isn't just one isolated incident. Maybe it's something that I really need to sort of reflect on and, and adjust. So there is safety in numbers. Um, if for whatever reason, you know, as mentioned before, the, the lecture is more lecture than, than visual, then get permission and tape record the lecture. I had a great religion professor in undergrad that was amazing. He didn't have any PowerPoints, he didn't read any books, he barely drew on the board or anything. He just spoke and he was incredible, he was very charismatic, but all he did was talk and... I'm the kind of person that likes seeing some sort of visual thing to kind of help trigger my memory later on tests, um, and I do enjoy, you know, I did enjoy listening to him, um, but oftentimes I couldn't take notes fast enough for him. So, you know, he was the kind of professor that you, you sort of see his lectures, you walk into the classroom and there's just a row of tape recorders on a table in front of him because everybody had the same idea to tape record his lectures because he was a great lecturer, but he didn't 
do anything else. So our only recourse was to tape record his lectures and then be able to listen back to them. But always get permission because some professors are just not into that sort of thing. And as, as usual, you can always meet with them after class. Um, usually a syllabus will have something like office hours um, or at the very least an email where you can contact them or directly after class might be a good place for you to just sort of come up to them and go, hey, I'm having this issue XYZ and you might sort of catch them in that, in, 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 in that moment and, and be able to sort of fix your problem, right? So meet with them after class, meet with them away from class, it's okay, schedule a meeting. You know, that's what things like office hours are for. That's what things like email addresses are for. Um, you know, we would rather have you ask questions when you have issues than towards the end of the semester when it might be too late to change something, right? So whenever you have an issue, you know, don't be scared. Go up to them, right? Because you know, you are, at this point, you are kind of partners in your education. And so you want to make sure that you are getting everything you can get out of that class. So we've taken notes, we've dealt with our instructors in whatever way is appropriate. And you've taken notes, you've gone to class. Now we need to evaluate whether our notes did the actual thing we meant them to do. So do your notes represent what was discussed? Is it more doodle than information? Do they represent what was discussed? Do they represent what the instructor thought was important? Um, are you sort of writing things that might sort of necessarily be kind of inconsequential? Are you kind of, you know, writing down that big quote from the author that they put on the PowerPoint? You don't necessarily need to write down that entire quote. Maybe you need to write down what the professor said about that quote and what that quote meant, right? So figure out whether that represents what the instructor thought was important and see if there's anything unclear. And, you know, check your handwriting, <laughs> check your abbreviations, right? Make sure that you're not being messy about it. Um, that way you can have some nice, clear notes to work with. Now when we rethink, Rethink your notes as soon as possible. Don't just sort of take your notes and then have them sort of sit in your notebook until it comes time for you to cram for your exam, which you don't do because you study way ahead of time. So rethink your notes as soon as possible um, and, and, and make it an active process. Maybe you have a best friend that isn't necessarily taking the class and have them, have them ask you whatever it is that you learned today. Maybe you want to tell your folks what it is that you learned today. Um, maybe you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something that, that isn't in the same major and, you know, interact with them and sort of tell them what it is that you learned today because that might be a really, really good way of internalizing the information. If you can explain what happened in class to someone that doesn't necessarily know what's going on, then that's a good way of being able to know whether or not you've internalized the information. So make it an active process. Go over your notes and, and highlight things that you think are important. Um, think critically about the material. How does everything make you feel? Um, do you agree with some things? Do you disagree with some things? Do things, do some authors make more sense than others? Do you agree with some arguments over others? Do you like this sociological theory over this other one? Think critically about the material and try and figure out ways that, that things can be applied in everyday life. Even something as little as saying, oh yeah, that thing she talked about reminded me of this one episode of Star Trek. That could be the key to being able to internalize and remember that information a lot better. So think critically about the material. Don't just let it sit there in your notebook waiting for you to cram for an exam. One way to sort of rework your notes is by using a concept map. And a concept map is just a way to kind of graphically organize your ideas. And this is especially good for all of you kind of visual learners out there. So how does a concept map work? You have a main theme in the middle. So let's say that it's taking notes. Why not? You stick taking notes there in the middle. and around that main theme are different ideas and that are related to whatever that main theme is. So we'll say um, taking notes is your main theme and then maybe idea one 
can be things like preparing and then you can have organizing, working, evaluating, and stick another bubble in there for rethinking perhaps. Um, maybe you are writing about Romeo and Juliet. Your main theme could be uh, love and then you can talk about all the different instances of love in there. Maybe a main theme could be death and then all of the instances there. A main theme being, um, I don't know, family rivalry or something and then all of these sort of related ideas there. It's a really really cool way of being able to rework your notes especially if you are a a visual learner. Ah, and study notes. Now study notes are different. Study notes are, you know, so, you, so you've taken notes in class and everything um, but you want to prepare specifically for an exam. Um, you can create what are called study notes, and these are notes taken for the purpose of reviewing your material for the purposes of a test. One kind of way that you can do it is to write on your textbook, and I know that sounds weird, especially in perhaps if you are kind of used to a situation where, where you don't necessarily own your textbook. Maybe your school owns your textbook, so that sounds a little taboo. But when it comes to college, you are pretty much you know, maybe you're renting them, but maybe you're buying a lot of your textbooks and they're yours. Um, and so if they are yours, make them work for you, right? So write on your textbook if it's going to help. If there is a really, really cool, you know, dictionary definition in a book, right? Nice big bolded word there with the definition right next to it. Maybe you highlight it and then in the margins, write down some examples of that thing. Um, circle, highlight, do whatever it is that you need to do on the textbook to make things make sense for you. Seriously. If it's yours, whatever. It's not like you're going to get a lot of value for it when you resell it, so you might as well use it to do your best possible job in that semester. Another thing you could do is you could create flashcards. I mean, it's a little, you know, analog. It's not very digital, but whatever. So a flashcard is basically just an index card with important info. And this could actually be a really, really cool way of quizzing yourself on things like vocabulary words, quizzing yourself on important concepts, um, quizzing yourself on basically any sort of information. You could put one thing on the front, put one thing on the back, shuffle them up and, and see how well you do. What you can do is, is um, rather than uh, sort of taking your lecture notes and kind of rewriting them or reworking them, use whatever style you used for taking your lecture notes from your professor and apply that to take notes from books and articles in the exact same way. Instead of just reading them, actually take notes, take sort of separate notes from them and and use that in the same way as if you know the book was lecturing you or the article was lecturing you so all of those sort of tips and tricks that i gave you on how to take lecture notes do the same thing except you're reading directly from a book or an article so important things to look at when you are um, using either a powerpoint or using a textbook or an article very important things to look at so that you know especially if you have a lot of things to read which you know, the more advanced you get in the degree, the more reading you'll have to do, and you might need to speed through a couple of things. Not that I'm speaking from experience, but hey, you know, when you are in... When, when I'm working at a doctoral level, um, I'll have three classes in any given semester, and I will have a giant book to read every week for 15 weeks for each class. So that's a total of almost, you know, like what? I guess it'd be like 45 books in a semester potentially. So sometimes you gotta read things really, really quickly. So the way that you can do that is to sort of zero in on the very important things like headings and subheadings that are usually really, really big and basically tell you what the section is generally about. Look at chapter titles and also look for bold or italic type. Bold type will usually indicate an important term that will probably be defined both in the paragraph and probably in a, in a glossary section at the back of the book. And ita italic type is also a way of signifying important information. So zero in on those things, especially if you need to work quickly through a large volume of text. Cool. So 
Hopefully this will have gotten you to the point where you'll be taking notes like a pro and everybody will be begging you for your notes. <laughs> um, if all else fails, you know, survey your fellow students and see what kind of note-taking style works for them and play around with different things. Um, maybe you're the kind of person who gets it all right at once and your notes are totally perfect for studying later. Maybe you need to rework things a few times in order to get it. Um, but practice. Practice makes perfect and soon you'll be able to figure out something that works perfectly for you. Next week we will teach you some more fun tips on how to get the most of your education so you can nail exams because I know that's important and that's probably coming up for a lot of you soon, right? So take care and take good notes.